Um, I'll start by saying uh, I was not a chemistry professor, though, so I am not necessarily chemically intelligent. Um, I was a biology professor, um, and in my role, it's to understand what the market needs um, and build products accordingly. And it works actually pretty well because I taught a bunch of students who also took chemistry. Um, so I'm not going to tell you guys how to, um, to do chemical reactions. I might make some mistakes with my discussion here. Uh, don't hold it against me. Um, I also want to acknowledge my colleagues who, if, if you're going to the, the meeting in Boston in a, uh, what is it, a week, um, you'll meet these folks. They'll give a similar presentation. Margaret Trombley and Megan Falano are, are uh, actual chemists who are our content developers. Charles Hall is our product capabilities manager, and then Jeannie Zaleski is my boss who covers um, chemistry and physics across the board. So what we're going to discuss today, I was, uh, you know, there's some things that I've already been hit on that I'm really excited to see more of, but I'm going to show you how we have integrated Marvin Sketch through ChemAxon into an education online homework system. Um, okay. So we use a product called Mastering Chemistry. Um, Mastering was originally developed by uh, David Pritchard at MIT to, to be a, a smart tutor for physics. And so it translated really well into general chemistry. There's been some real challenges to move it toward organic chemistry that we'll talk about today, show you some cool things. But in terms of reach, um, almost three million students use mastering of some sort, and now we've extended it beyond chemistry and physics to biology, to oceanography, to environmental science, all sorts of disciplines. Um, in chemistry alone last year, over half a million students registered for mastering chemistry. So a lot of students are using this, um, but there are some real challenges with getting you know, people who don't know much about chemistry right into a, a drawing tool and, and, drawing, and drawing structures. So we'll talk about some of those. Um, the power of mastering, uh, the, the, the thing that I usually start a presentation to a group of faculty about trying to convince them to use this is I ask them how many of their students come and see them in office hours. And I was a pretty friendly professor. What percentage of students do you think came to see me in office hours? 5%? I usually hear 5%. Kind of the upper echelon is 20%. Those people are like... I don't know, something super charismatic about them that I don't have, I don't know. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the reality is that if more than that came, you wouldn't have time for them anyway, right? I mean, it's not your job to, like, personally tutor every, every student. And for me, the, the ones that did come weren't really the ones that needed it the most. A lot of times they were the ones that already had the right answer and just wanted validation of the right answer. Or they were the ones that, like, sometimes it was like, okay, let's take a look at your work. Ooh. Maybe you need to think about a different major. Let's have some advising about where you go next. And that was pretty common. Um, so what we were trying to do was to emulate an office hours-like experience because that was some of the most fun and like enlightening times when you see the light bulb go on for a student. But most of them aren't coming to see you. Most of them don't have that. So how can we provide them with feedback on working problems in a way that is helpful to them is, you know, formative and it, is, it creates learning. So what mastering does is instead of looking for a specific structure drawn in uh, Marvin JS, what it does is it uses specific evaluators. And this is powered through, I'll, I'll show you a slide of the, of the, the workflow on this, the, the way that the, the data is moved around, um, through an ACE organic evaluator. So if anyone has heard of Bob Grossman, he was one of, the, I think, the first users for, uh, or one of your power users at the beginning. We partnered with him for all the evaluation aspects of our software. And the way that works is it's not looking, like I said, for specific truck structures. The, uh, the, the authors of the problem uh, use these, um, whoops, use these specific evaluators that, um, I think this is my, yeah, there we go. Uh, these are specific evaluators that can be authored. And then what is really neat about this is if, if um, these are basically a series of if-then statements. If any of those failed, it triggers specific feedback that the student gets. So in this case, you know, they were supposed to draw something that didn't have a, a that was a, had a central carbon instead of having a, a carbon chain there. And so um, they get really targeted feedback. So, you know, this is what a professor would say to the student in an office hours like experience. Your, your structure has got to have a methyl group on it. You know, start with a central carbon. Is that as good as coming to see a professor? I, none of us would argue that that's the case, right? But 95% of them aren't coming to see us anyway. And so this is a really valuable experience for students. So um, this can be extended so that authors can write specific feedback. And then there's a whole bunch of generic feedback that's really, uh, you know, like in this case, the 
student didn't, didn't even draw the right structure, right? So um, the structure you've drawn does not have the correct number of atoms. Um, so there's very generic, there's specific feedback that can be authored, and then the author themselves um, write the criteria that need to be uh, achieved in order to get the, the answer correct. If all of those if-then statements are uh, fulfilled, then the student gets the answer right. But if they don't, they get some valuable feedback. The other really cool thing is that, and I love this part about it, and I think this is something that we're working to extend for our next generation of these systems, is when they make a mistake, I haven't shown, I've just been showing drawing structures so far, but we also use it to uh, have students show us how they understand reactivity. So you can move electrons around, and if you make a mistake in a multi-step mechanism, you get this feedback that gives you a link to see the products you would have created by the incorrect electron flow in this box that's highlighted in red. And so this pops up a new window. I was trying to make this, I made this instead. So that allows a student to kind of reverse engineer what the right answer might have been. Right? And so I don't think any other of our uh, competitors has this system. It's based upon the work with Bob that we've done. Um, and you know, this is super valuable to students. So I was having a nice chat at breakfast this morning. One of my frustrating things about this is students, I'm gonna be honest, students do not love using this for their homework. They think of it as being incredibly um, picky. They think of it as being very, um, they think of it as being um, like very summative. Like they're worried about the points. They're terrible at math, right? So they don't understand that like, they make a mistake on this, it's 3% off on that particular problem. And um, in the grand scheme of the course, that means next to nothing, right? So what I'm thinking is ways that we can leverage this feedback to make it into more of a, a sandbox type experience. So could we put a, could we put a button in our uh, palette here that would allow them to predict the product from electron flow in a given box? And so they could see that um, in the nearer term for some early uh, exposure to a reaction type, and then later on they'd have to maybe work it without that help. But initially it might be more helpful for them. So that's one thing that we're thinking about doing. But this predict product thing is a, a really pretty slick thing for students. Um, in addition, the system is, is really designed to be formative, and that's why I'm trying to lean that way with our next generation stuff. In a lot of cases we have hints that are available to students that are things that break the problem down into like scaffolded steps. So in, in this case, you know, you're drawing this uh, aldehyde and it gives you some, uh, you know, a drag and drop type exercise, thinking about what, uh, what oxidation and re reduction are. You know, is it gain or loss of hydrogens and oxygens? Um, so breaks the problem down into something simpler that students can, can work on, might be achievable for them. If they work through all these hints, then maybe they can go back to the main body of the problem. So really breaking it down, again, like you would do in an office hour. Um, we've improved a lot with the Marvin JS of how the electron flow arrows work. Uh, our, our professor customers struggle with this a fair bit because you know, it's, a, it's a system where you can only drag the electrons to a very specific spot. And they say, well, this isn't like paper, right? Because they could drag them anywhere on paper. Um, but it's gotten better because before you, know, you, could, you could grab electrons from an atom now, um, you have to, uh, you actually have to pull from the electrons themselves and they pop up really nicely um, so that we can move electrons. Um, and then after drawing the initial electron flow, this little dotted line tells the student explicitly where they've, where they've moved, the, moved the electron. So that's, that's a vast improvement over the previous versions. They still, uh, you know, there's still a, a fair number of our customers that think learning the tool is more of a challenge than it's worth. Um, and we're working against that by the, you know, thinking of ways to make it more formative for students. Um, there is a, um, you know, a lot of options in terms of what the, 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 the author of the um, questions can do in terms of lone pairs, um, whether, they, um, whether they show skeletal uh, or uh, explicit hydrogens. What else do we have in here? Um, so there's toolbars. Uh, oh yeah, this is really nice. Um, one of the reasons why we, uh, we partnered with, with you guys compared to some of our competitors that use other sketching tools was that you, you were really good about allowing us to have customized toolbars depending upon the item type. So in this case, you're just drawing a structure. You notice that there's no electron flow options here, right? That's only gonna pop up for a student 
if they're moving, if they're doing a reaction type. So that's not true in, in other options in this space. So we really appreciate the fact that we have these custom toolbars. We're moving towards doing uh, other, um, other Lewis structure type things, which right now are in Flash. Uh, so this is how it works, generally, the architecture. The student works in Marvin.js, and that information is sent to our server. And like I've mentioned before, the evaluation request goes to ACE evaluator code that Bob helps us out with in the JCAM library, and the Marvin.js goes to JCAM. And so this is how the, the, uh, the basic architecture works, which allows us to do all that cool stuff with the wrong answer feedback um, and, and whatnot. Effie mentioned accessibility. You'd be amazed how uh, important this is in our world. Uh, it's, a, it's actually kind of a frustrating thing because we spend a lot of money on making things more accessible because you know, there are a small but very important subset of students that need accessible tools. This stuff is super hard to make accessible, right? I mean, how do you make it so that a, a blind student can work through this stuff? And we're trying our best in partnership with you guys to do this. Uh, things like Effie mentioned with the, the color patterns, um, those are, you know, there's standards for the web on these. Every button has to have a, a keyboard fo focus, but explaining what's going on um, in, these, in, in these systems is, uh, it's a real challenge. Um, and so you know, we spend a, a lot of effort and um, time and money in order to do this, um, which is you know, sometimes frustrating me, for me because we, that means we don't have money for other cool things that help the masses. But this is a super important endeavor, um, and I'm glad to see you guys are focusing on it. Um, we are improving the uh, Lewis. So th these, are, these are the last few things um, I'll go through are some of our wish list type things. And these are things that are um, in, the, in the offing soon. Improvements uh, right now, we're not using Marvin.js for our Lewis structure drawing, which is uh, really important in our general chemistry courses. But we, b the ability to use unpaired and lone pairs of electrons be, to, be, to be manually added and graded, right now we can't do that, so we're moving toward that. And then we can't currently do this. You'd be amazed how many professors complain about not having the ability to add brackets for ionic species. They just simply will like, this is out for, for my general chemistry class because you can't do that. Um, so these are things that we need to address and we're working toward those with your help. So let me talk a little bit about synthesis. Synthesis is something that I showed the, the mechanism drawing. Synthesis is something that's really hard to do in, uh, within the capabilities of our online systems. Because what does a student have to do on an exam? They're giving starting materials, they're giving ending materials, and they have basically the whole suite of synthetic conditions um, to, to create you know, the, the products from that. Well, that's pretty tough for us um, because what, what, what we don't have is, is um, we don't have an answer type that can support that. And so one thing that we do are these synthesis maps where you can take a product in the middle and you can give the student the reaction conditions and they have to create the the, the precursor, some sort of retrosynthetic analysis type thing. We also can do it where we have a drag and drop situation where students are given the starting materials and the ending materials and a whole suite of intermediates and reaction conditions. But on the test, do you get the intermediates? You don't get the intermediates on a test, right? You don't get a subset of the reaction conditions. You have all the options. And so we're hoping um, to move towards something that's more like this, where um, we would have a drop-down menu that would provide them with a full suite of reaction conditions. And, you know, Bob Grossman can do this in his Ace Organic software. So the, 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 the Pearson issue is how much effort do we put into this? Um, because um, Pearson, if you guys are familiar with our company, it's, a, um, it's the world's largest education company. So we don't just serve uh, chemistry students. In fact, we don't even just serve science students. We serve people teaching art history and, and all these other things. So it's, in order to get the development time um, to do these types of things, is a, it's a kind of a, a horse trading type scenario. I have to lobby very hard with what the, what the business proposition is for this sort of thing in order to uh, justify the, the development time. And this is why, in many cases, we partner with folks like you, because we were discussing at breakfast, right? Because um, you're better at it than we are, uh, a lot better. And that, that's worked out well. Um, in addition to that, um, I've mentioned this predict 
predictive mechanism type thing. So like if I had drawn this, if I maybe I could hit, I could draw that and hit a check answer button, or maybe I could draw this and there'd be a button where it would automatically produce the product that is uh, that would be made by my electron uh, flow. And you saw that we can do that already. They get that in the wrong answer feedback, but I think it'd be a really great experience for students to get that prior to losing points. Right? Our NPS scores for this product are not, um, it's not as high as we'd like to be. We'd like students to like using this more. We'd like them to get more value out of it, to see the value. They don't think of it as much of a learning tool as what we would like. And I think there's an opportunity to, to really help uh, improve that. Um, so I, I, I think that's uh, the, the, the nuts and bolts. We've had a great partnership working with ChemAxon. Um, like I said, in general, you know, we're, we're, we've serviced over half a million students that are, that are going from lo knowing almost no chemistry to coming out um, as your future doctors a lot of times. So um, we hope we're doing a good job with this and we look forward to partnering with you guys in the future. So I'm curious, do you keep track of what the students do and like some kind of algorithm to figure out what they get wrong and then focus on that? Not only for the individual student, but kind of a machine learning for everybody and kind of Done that track. Yeah, so it's it's a really it's a good it's a good idea. Um, so yeah, all of our content is is uh, we're, we're we're working toward mapping it in a better way so that we recognize. Um, so one of the things that I I had them do recently was we have you know like almost three million students using this right. So we know like if we went in and looked like does a student work this? Uh, so there's there's a a dichotomy in our item library, which is pretty cool, between what I'd call formative tutorial style things with wrong answer feedback and then more summative content. It's like a quiz. Um, for any given learning objective, it's, it's really uh, like what we could go through and do is say, for this topic, which of the tutorials predict the best success on end of chapter problems? And then ultimately what you would like to do is offer up some adaptive technology that says you miss this end of chapter problem here's a great tutorial for you to do, right? And so um, we have that in a sense for, uh, for general chemistry. We, we have these assignments that you work a regular, what we call a parent assignment. And it, it provides a, a follow-up assignment called an adaptive follow-up that is specifically tailored to what you struggled on in that. But we should be, we should be absolutely doing this for organic too. Um, it's just a little bit harder to do. And we start off by having a subject matter expert build the map of the content. But yeah, of course, machine learning should take over that at some point, right? It seems like you have the data. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I completely agree. And so Pearson has invested heavily in, in adaptive technology. We have a, like now we have a senior vice president of, of, of adaptive. Um, it's, I think it's working. It's, you know, everybody knows that it's the, uh, it's the wave of the future. And the fact that we have that user base well, yeah, right now, yeah, fair, fair enough. Uh, but the, the fact that we have, all of that data is probably, that's, that's what's most valuable, right? So we have the most users. We need to leverage that as much as possible. I think it's a super exciting thing to think about. I'm just curious, how do people usually reach this offering? I mean, is this part of the course material? Is this some um, part of, I don't know, a university deal? Is it people they sign up for individually? It's a good question. So. Um, there's a, a number of different ways to get it. Generally, you know, so we have an interesting business model generally because we, we pitch this stuff with, usually with an associated textbook to uh, faculty members, but the faculty members most of the time don't purchase it, right? The students do. And so um, our, our biggest charge for our sales force is convincing the faculty members that they need to require this for their students. And if they do that, then there's you know, multiple ways for them to get it. Um, through the bookstore, um, or w they can buy directly from us. I'll be honest, we're not that great at distribution. Um, so, like, uh, we, uh, we sell our books to Amazon, and Amazon rents them to them as a package. Um, and so we, we lose a lot of money. Our biggest competitor these days is not McGraw-Hill or Cengage, other publishers. It's, it's, really, it's really Amazon. Um, but... Um, uh, the, the company's also moving toward a whole bunch of inclusive access models with partnerships with the universities so that they, um, you know, students, students complain about the price of books, but the price of books has got books in online systems has gone up slower than tuition, but it comes right out of their pocket, right? And I don't blame them for complaining about the price, but uh, the inclusive access model means that it just comes with a course fee that's, that's rolled in their tuition and, and uh, Pearson would much prefer that model. I'm all right. 
As long as, as, long as we help them learn, that's my job, make these better to, to help them learn.